a friend see it, you'll get a, uh, a link to that video tomorrow. So um, take it away, Shannon, and thank you very much for speaking with us today. All right, thank you for that introduction, Mike, and thank you to all of you for tuning in and welcoming us into whether you're in your home, in your office, maybe you're in your car, I'm really, really thankful that you've chosen to share your evening with us and to allow me to speak with you about uh, some of my work. So today I'm really excited to talk with you about some work that I'm doing along with other researchers and extension professionals to support Maryland's growing oyster aquaculture industry. But before we dive in too far, I want to take just a minute to clarify, you know, what does that term aquaculture mean? Well, the term aquaculture just refers to farming that takes place underwater. That's it. It's as simple as that. And there are a lot of different species that are aquacultured worldwide. So we have kelps and macroalgaes. We have mussels, as you see in the top right. A lot of different species of fin fish are grown in aquaculture facilities worldwide. But today, our organism of interest is oysters and oyster aquaculture. Now, oyster aquaculture is a form of passive or extensive aquaculture. And what that means is that the farmer doesn't have to add any food or any water quality amendments to their plot or their harvest area. The oysters are just eating the food that's naturally occurring in the water around them. And so here's a little schematic of one of these passive uh, forms of aquaculture. Uh, there are mussels hanging from ropes along the left and then over towards the right. We've got some scallops and a lantern net in the middle. And then in cages along the bottom, you can see oysters. And so like I said, the farmer isn't adding any food to these. These organisms are filtering algae or microscopic plants out of the water around them. And in the Chesapeake Bay and in many coastal areas worldwide, we actually can have an overabundance of algae or an overabundance of phytoplankton in our coastal waterways. And that's a result of a lot of nutrients coming into those coastal waterways and it triggers these big dense algae blooms. And there's nothing wrong with having uh, algae in coastal waterways. It's, it's perfectly normal and perfectly natural, but it's when those systems get out of balance that we can run into just a little bit of trouble. And so in that way, forms of aquaculture like this, such as oysters, mussels, that they are really a win-win because the oysters are sitting at a buffet of all of their favorite foods. They have ample algae to eat. And as they're eating it, they're clearing that out of the water and they're leaving cleaner and more clear water that other species can enjoy. And so like I say, it's really a win-win. And one of the things that I think is so interesting about these big aquaculture operations is that if you're on this boat and you're on the surface and you're sailing by, you see a couple of buoys, you might see a few lines, but you really don't see this, the productivity um, and the scale and all of the life that's going on just underneath the surface. And worldwide, aquaculture is actually occurring at a pretty big scale. So what you're looking at here is a plot that's showing the tons of seafood that have been harvested using wild capture production in the orange area versus the seafood that has been harvested using aquaculture methods of production, which is represented by that teal area. And what I wanna draw your attention to is that since about the late 80s, early 90s, we've seen that wild capture production worldwide kind of hit a, hit a plateau. We're not finding new fish and finding new uh, fisheries to exploit. However, aquaculture production is really continuing to grow quite strongly, uh, so much so that now aquaculture production makes up a substantial portion of the seafood that people eat worldwide. And this brings us to our first poll of the evening. So this is going to be an interactive session today. 
Uh, this first poll is on the season for slurping. This is a true or false statement. So you should have a little dialogue box that just popped up on your screen and you'll answer true or false. You should only eat oysters in months with an R in their name. So go ahead and make your selection using the little uh, toggle switch that's, to, that's just to the left of the answer that you think is correct. And don't worry, these are all anonymous. And so don't worry if you don't get it right. We'll give a few more seconds to get answers in and then we can look at the results. Okay, so 26% of you said that that statement was true and 74% of you said that that answer was false. Well, those that said false, you got it right. Uh, so whether it is winter, spring, summer, or fall, uh, farmed oysters are always in season. And that's thanks in part to a couple of different things, but primarily refrigeration, right? And so years ago when that old adage got started that said you should only eat oysters in months that have an R in their name, well, that's because those are the months that are associated with cooler weather, at least here in the Northern Hemisphere. However, now with a widespread availability of refrigeration, Oyster farmers can get up early, they can get out on their leases, harvest oysters, and have them under refrigeration at a nice cool temperature so that we can all enjoy fresh, safe, farmed oysters year round. Now aquaculture, oyster aquaculture, in Maryland and generally around the U.S. takes on one of two different formats. We have water column leases, as you see represented by that uh, image on the top. And that's where oysters are containerized and suspended off of the seafloor. And then on the bottom, we have a submerged land lease. And this refers to an area where oysters are planted, grown, and harvested directly from the from suitable bottom. And we already know that as these oysters are growing, right, they're consuming algae, they're filtering the water, but what they're also doing is they're providing habitat for a lot of different organisms. One of my favorite things about pulling up an oyster cage is seeing all of the fish and the crabs and worms and all of this life that comes up with all of those oysters. They really are providing a great habitat for a diverse array of species. And that brings us to our second poll of the evening. This poll is on habitat creators, the role of oysters as habitat creators. All right, so you should see a poll launched on your screen now. Uh, this is a multiple choice poll, and there are actually two correct answers here. So you've got a pretty good shot of getting it right. Uh, so fill in the blank. An oyster farm can support how many more organisms than barren seafloor bottom? And when I say barren seafloor bottom, bottom, what I mean is just barren mud. So no oysters, no seagrass, just mud. How many more organisms do you think are supported by an oyster farm than barren mud? Is it twice as many, 12 times as many, 32 times as many, or 100 times as many? All right, so not a lot of takers on twice as many. Uh, we've got 23% of you said 12 times as many, 50% said 32 times, and 36% said 100 times as many. And the answer is both 12 and 32. So it actually depends on the way that the oysters are grown. So scientific research has shown that submerged land leases can support up to 12 times as many organisms as barren mud, and oysters grown in water column leases can provide or can support up to 32 times as many organisms as barren mud. So like I said, these are really diverse, rich habitat areas. So for all of the good ecosystem services that these oysters are providing, how is this industry doing? How is the oyster aquaculture industry in Maryland? What you're looking at here is a plot that's showing the number of bushels of oysters that have been harvested from aquaculture leases in Maryland since 2012. 
And this is broken down into two different sections. So the lighter bars represent oysters harvested from water column leases, and those darker blue bars represent oysters harvested from submerged land leases. And what you can see here is this industry is growing. It's doing pretty well. The 2018 season saw a little bit of a drop off in harvest. And don't know if you folks remember, uh, but in the Chesapeake region, at least, the 2018 season was characterized by record rainfall. And so that combined with a couple of other issues is why we think we saw a little bit of a trend down in the harvest that year. But in general, this industry is growing really strongly. Now, despite this excellent growth, uh, there are still a number of challenges and obstacles that this industry has to overcome. And so that's what we'll get into talking about next here. Uh, we're just gonna go over these really briefly and then we'll dive deeper into a couple of these issues in the coming slides. So some of the challenges to oyster farmers in Maryland include shell availability, uh, larvae and nursery culture, disease. There are two primary diseases that affect oysters here in Chesapeake Bay. Uh, Gear selection can be a major decision for water column oyster growers, environmental changes, uh, biofouling, and then the regulatory process of leasing and public perception can be a major hurdle to oyster farmers as they're either entering the industry or looking to expand their business. So we'll dive deeper into a couple of these, starting with shell availability. So when oysters first begin their life, they actually start out as a larvae. And that larvae is a free swimming, or rather free floating form. And they'll spend about two to three weeks in that larval period. And then once those larvae are mature, they will swim down and they start looking for a suitable substrate or material on which to set. And when I say set, I mean they will look for this material, they'll find a good habitat, and then they excrete almost a bit of a glue and they attach themselves onto that location. And that's when we refer to them as a stack. You know, once they've attached, they're stuck. There's no changing their minds. There's no moving to the suburbs when they wanna have kids, they are stuck. And so it's really important that they find a suitable substrate and a good habitat. Well, it turns out, all the oyster shell is the preferred substrate for larval settlement. And here in Maryland, along with many other regions, that's actually a really limited resource. We just don't have as much old oyster shell as we would like to. And so researchers have been working over the years to try and come up with what we call alternative substrates or other materials that we could create in the lab that could be used for oyster settlement. And one of those researchers is actually right here at Horn Point. So Matt Gray is a professor here at Horn Point, and he's been working with the Maryland Institute College of Art in this really creative, collaborative project to try and develop and grow an alternative substrate that could be used to promote oyster settlement. And so while the researchers are hard at work in the lab trying to figure out how to make new substrates, there are also groups who are working to conserve our existing resources. And here in Maryland, the Oyster Recovery Partnership offers a shell recycling program. And what they do in that program is they work with uh, restaurants and raw bars so that instead of those oysters getting shucked in the restaurant and then the shells ending up in the garbage, uh, Oyster Recovery Partnership facilitates those oyster shells being saved, and then ORP comes, they pick them up, they take them to their facility where they're cleaned and aged, and then they're used as a substrate for larval oysters to set on. Speaking of larval oysters, uh, here's a microscopic image of oyster larvae. Uh, these little guys are tiny. Each one of these is less than like a quarter of a millimeter in size. And while they are, I mean, they're pretty robust, right? They, they spend about two to three weeks 
just you know floating around um, in natural waterways in the wild. And so they are pretty hardy and pretty robust, but they're babies and they do take some TLC and they take a little bit of a delicate touch. And so to that end, the UMSEs, along with Oyster Recovery Partnership, uh, the Maryland Sea Grant Extension Program, and Maryland Department of Natural Resources have been working together over the years to put on a series of workshops and programs to help train current and prospective oyster growers to work with these really delicate larvae so that they can effectively set their own larvae to improve their businesses. For water column growers, the choice of what kind of cage or basket you're gonna grow your oysters in is a really, really big choice. And here at Horn Point, we've installed a demonstration oyster farm so that we can compare oyster performance in a couple of these different popular gear types. And then we can share that information with the oyster growers so that they can decide which, if any, they would like to put out onto their own farm. And one of my colleagues with the University of Maryland Extension, uh, Matt Parker, is an economist. And so he analyzes all of the data on the cost to purchase all of these gear types, the cost to operate and maintain them over time and provides that economic data to the industry as well. Because at the end of the day, these growers have to be able to make money, so they have to be economically uh, profitable. Now, environmental changes and climate change is you know, this umbrella issue that we are all grappling with, and oyster aquaculture is, is no exception. And here in our region, uh, one of the anticipated effects moving into the future are more intense storm events. During these really intense storm events, they can dump a lot of rain over what is a relatively small region that all, or well, a large region that all drains into the Chesapeake Bay. When you get all of that rain entering the bay, it can actually dilute the salt content or the salinity of the bay. Now, oysters require some salinity to be able to live, and during these really intense periods of rain and when we get prolonged low salinity events, we can see reduced oyster growth and even oyster mortality. And so researchers from uh, UMSEs in Maryland, as well as collaborators in Virginia, New Jersey, and a host of other states have all been working together to try and see what can we do? Can we breed an oyster that would be tolerant to those salinity fluctuations in that low salinity environment. And here at Horn Point, we've got a couple of folks working on this. On the left is Lewis Plow. Uh, and then on the right there is Lexi McCarty, who's a fellow graduate student. And Lexi is doing her dissertation in looking at breeding one of these low salinity tolerant oysters specific to Maryland waters. And then Lewis is her advisor. And he's my advisor as well. And last but not least, an issue that is near and dear to my heart, uh, biofouling. So this term biofouling kind of collectively refers to plants and animals that will colonize either the oysters or the cage materials. And they can really affect the productivity of oyster farms. And they can also affect the marketability of, of the oysters. Uh, so for an oyster farmer to sell this oyster, they would have to scrape it, tumble it, clean it. And that takes time and effort. Um, and trust me, these folks already work plenty, plenty hard. And so one of the things that I've been looking into is identifying management practices that the oyster farmers can use throughout the growing process so that when the oyster reaches market size, it looks like this, instead of like this. And so they can achieve this by inverting those cages and allowing the cages and the oysters to sit in the sun for a little bit of time each week. And it really helps to grow an oyster that is a lot cleaner and more market ready. Uh, and in my opinion, a lot more appetizing. And that brings us to our final poll of the evening. Uh, this poll is called Time to Eat. This is another multiple choice poll, so you can select as many answers as you like. Uh, but here we wanna know what is the best way to enjoy oysters in your opinion. 
Do you like them raw with lemon and hot sauce? Grilled with butter and Old Bay? Broiled with garlic and Parmesan? Do you like oysters Rockefeller? Or do you just straight out of the water? Let us know how you prefer your oysters. I don't know if you guys can hear it, but there's a huge swarm outside right now. I'm sorry if you're getting some feedback. All right. Wow, so our results are pretty evenly split. It looks like eating oysters raw with lemon and hot sauce has just eked out first place, followed by broiled with garlic and Parmesan, and then fresh out of the water, followed by grilled with butter and Old Bay, and oysters Rockefeller came in last place. So this is a, the healthy group we've got on here today. With that, I would like to thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thanks for tuning in, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Great. Thank you very much, Shannon. Um, one of the early questions when um, we were talking about Horn Point was, uh, can people visit us now? And unfortunately, the answer is no. So right now, the lab, we're under what we call phase one research, where um, we have students uh, just working on their, uh, finishing up their degrees, uh, taking care of uh, animals, the oyster hatchery, but um, fingers crossed, hopefully this fall will uh, we'll open up again. But we have unfortunately had to cancel our open house, but um, so that's, that's that. Um, so here, I'll, I'll read out some of the questions to uh, uh, Shannon. Uh, this is from Greg. What is the relative cost difference between the two methods? And that, that was referring to the uh, surface cages, Shannon, or on the bottom? Good question. And uh, you can actually take this in two different ways. So there's, you know, the relative cost of producing those oysters or the cost that, that buyers pay uh, to purchase them. And so with submerged land leases, those oysters are much less expensive for the oyster farmer to grow, right? And so in those leases, um, it's really about quantity. They'll be out and they'll harvest bushels and bushels of oysters, um, and they don't have to put as much work into those oysters. That's not to say that it is not difficult work. It's just to say that they're not having to bring the oysters on board and tumble them and put in quite as much flavor to create these, you know, perfect little round oysters that are destined for raw bars. So in those submerged land leases, they're generally growing a product that will be sold to shucking houses. And so they're not necessarily concerned with what the outside of the shell looks like. It's more about the volume and the quantity. So like I said, you don't have to put quite as much TLC into getting that perfect shape. Whereas oysters grown in those water column leases are typically destined for restaurants or raw bars. And so they really have to have uniform, nice rounded shape, free of blemishes or biofouling organisms. And so they have to put significantly more effort into those oysters, which does make them more costly to grow. And so conversely, they have to sell those oysters at a higher price to be able to recoup their costs. Great, thank you. Um, here's a question from a April Morton. Why do water column leases support more biodiversity than submerged land leases, does that suggest that water column leases support more biodiversity than natural oyster reefs? Great, great question. And I'll tell you that I don't know from any uh, scientific standpoint, but I'll tell you my, my speculation is, you know, on a natural oyster reef, you would have those reefs that grow really tall and three-dimensional. And so there's a lot of what we call interstitial spaces or little crevices for all of those critters to hide. And uh, oysters that are grown on submerged land leases are generally not getting into being huge reefs um, because they're going to be harvested. Now that's not to say they don't provide good habitat, it's just you don't get quite as much of those little interstitial spaces for all of the fish and crabs and things to hide. And then also, when they're putting oysters out in these cages on the water column leases, the cage itself becomes new habitat, right? And so that cage goes out clean and that becomes an area that all of these 
selling organisms and others can colonize and make a home out of. So Shannon, do you have any uh, ballpark figure for what the aquaculture harvest was in 2019? I don't. Um, so all of those figures come through the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. They have a whole division that's dedicated, I think it's called their Aquaculture um, Fisheries Enhancement uh, Program. However, uh, because we're all, everyone is working from home during the pandemic, they haven't been able to finalize those harvest data from 2019 yet. We haven't seen those. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, how does tide affect the water column oysters? Oh, good question. These are great questions. Um, so in the Chesapeake Bay, we don't have, if you tuned in to the first seminar that Bill Boyport gave, you would have learned that we don't have much by way of a tidal range. Uh, we do experience tides, but they're not particularly reliable, and they are, they tend to be about a foot and a half or two feet. And so we don't really have intertidal oysters like they do in some other regions, New Jersey and points north. And so here, the only way that the tides will really affect uh, water column leases or any of our leases is during the winter. So during the winter, we can have some really extreme low tides, or we call them blowout tides. And what that can do is actually leave an area that's usually submerged and underwater, those blowout tides can leave those exposed for a prolonged period of time. And if that happens in conjunction with freezing temperatures and really cold wind, that could actually kill some of the oysters on that lease. And so when oyster farmers are planning their operations, that is a huge consideration for them in picking their site. They have to think about, is there sufficient water depth such that these oysters won't be exposed during those really, really cold months. Gotcha. You know, here's, here's a great question. Does aquaculture have more or less waste? Is it grown and harvested only when there is a market? You know, we waste so much food in the United States, so if there's a, not a market, what do they do with the oysters? Yeah, yeah. Well, the good thing about oysters is um, if there's not a market, they can just sit there. So the oysters can just continue to sit on the bottom or they can continue to sit in their cage. Um, and they won't be harvested until, they're, until there's a demand for them. And actually that's happening right now with a lot of oyster farms in Maryland and around the US and worldwide, as so many restaurants have closed their doors and folks aren't going out to eat because of the pandemic, we've actually seen oyster sales really, really decline during this pandemic. But the oysters can just stay in their cages or they can stay on the bottom and they continue to grow and, and they'll be there whenever we're ready to eat them again. How could, how could advocates help shift negative public perceptions of oyster farms in front of their property? Hmm, good question. So, you know, it's, it's interesting here in, in the Chesapeake Bay and in so many other regions, a lot of us feel a really strong tie to the view shed and the waterways and people like to enjoy them in really different ways. Um, and so some folks, they will see an oyster aquaculture farm as, as a blemish to the view shed. Um, and you know, all of those values are, are certainly uh, valid. However, you know, in terms of if you wanted to advocate, I would just encourage um, changing that perception and saying, hey, I actually think that they look pretty cool. I like to see the boat coming out in the morning. I love to see them out there turning the cages. And then we know that just by having those oysters out in front of that property, uh, they're providing ecosystem services in terms of cleaning the water, providing habitat. And then there's some anecdotal information and evidence from oyster farms that the presence of some of those cages can actually diminish the wave energy and may be able to help slow some shoreline erosion. Certainly not enough to outpace climate change and these really severe erosive properties, but there is some anecdotal information out there that indicates that these farms can be helpful in dampening those waves to protect the property. 
question. And how long does it take to get an oyster to market? Another good question. So as a rule of thumb, we'll generally say that a natural diploid oyster grows about an inch per year. However, uh, researchers uh, have created and bred oysters that can actually grow much faster. So some oysters can reach market size in 12 to 18 months. And part of that is through uh, the invention of, or not the invention of, but the adoption of a uh, triploidy by the oyster industry. And so you can think of a triploid oyster as the seedless watermelon of oyster growing. And these triploids are bred so that they don't naturally reproduce. And so instead of focusing so much effort and energy on reproduction during the summer, those triploid oysters can just continue eating all of that algae and putting all of that energy into growth and getting bigger instead of putting that energy into reproduction. And that can actually translate to some greatly increased growth rates of those triploid oysters such that you can get an oyster to market in 12 to 18 months in some locations. Gotcha. So when you said the, the wild an inch a year, so the, is it the legal limit for wild harvest is three inches for an oyster. Is it the same length for an aquaculture oyster? So that's uh, state by state. Uh, here in Maryland for our water column oysters, uh, they have to be two inches. Uh, the submerged land leases, they actually have to kind of split their regulations, which makes it a little bit uh, trickier on them. But during the public harvest season, when our public oyster bars are active uh, between October and March, uh, they have to wait until the, their aquacultured oysters are three inches, whereas the rest of the year they can follow suit with the water column leaseholders. What's the typical term length of, a, of a, a lease for a grower. Like how long do they, how long do they hang on to it? Right, is it five years, 10 years, forever? I mean, it's, there have been, I'm trying to think of any farms that I know that have actually just given up their leases. You know, some, some leases are just not productive. And actually there was a graduate student at Horn Point who uh, recently defended her thesis. And she was looking at you know, lease productivity and ways to maybe improve or increase lease productivity on those submerged land leases by improving the bottom substrate. And what she found in all of these different analyses is that really some of these areas are just not quite as conducive to oyster aquaculture as others. And so those areas, a farmer might choose to just abandon it if the oysters aren't doing well. But otherwise, they do tend to stay with the farmer or be passed down through the family or to another oyster farmer. But people typically get these leases and hang on to them. Gotcha. So I, I'll have a question related to that is, um, doesn't Maryland have this law, use it or lose it? So if you granted an oyster lease, you have to farm it, you know, otherwise you lose it. So it's not like Virginia where if I'm a homeowner, I could get an oyster lease and I have no intention of growing oysters. I just have a lease there so somebody else can't grow oysters in my front yard. Yep, that's right. So uh, Maryland has actually learned a lot of lessons from Virginia as we were getting our oyster aquaculture industry really supported when they changed the lease laws in 2009. And that was one of the big lessons that we were able to learn from Virginia was to include that use it or lose it clause. And so that basically says, that if you have an oyster lease, you have to prove that you're planting oysters on it and you're harvesting oysters off of it. And that's done through paperwork with the Department of Natural Resources. And it's so that folks can't engage in exclusionary leasing practices where, like you said, folks may choose to lease an area just to keep someone else off of it. We can't do that here in Maryland. So you have to grow oysters on your leases. So here's a question. What percent of farmed oysters are grown in the Bay nationally? Is our position growing? Is this like beer production where boutiques are popping up or are the big growers doing most of the production? Well, I wouldn't say that it's the big growers. I would say that it's the big states that are doing most of the production. And so 
on the East Coast, we've got Virginia and then some of the states in New England, like Massachusetts, that are responsible for the bulk of the oyster aquaculture production. And then out on the West Coast, we've got some big companies like Taylor Shellfish that are growing a ton of oysters. And so Maryland is really, a, we're a newer player on this scene. Um, there was some, there's been some aquaculture in our state for decades, but the leasing process and the regulatory process made it really, really challenging to get into oyster aquaculture. And that all changed in 2009. And so since then, we've seen a lot of growth, but compared to our neighbor to the South, Virginia, and compared to some of the other states around the US, uh, we're still a very, very small proportion of the amount of oysters that are being grown in aquaculture. Okay, thanks. So what is the most exciting or interesting finding that you found so far in your biofiling research? Well, uh, so what I found so far that I think is really cool is that you can control most of the species of biofouling that we have in the Chesapeake Bay just by flipping those cages and letting them sit in the sun for just four hours once a week. So like I said, biofouling is a, it's a big issue for growers. They spend a lot of time uh, cleaning cages, scrubbing oysters, and like I said, these are already really, really tough jobs. So if we can make this a little easier, that would be great. And so there are some of these cages that just float right on the surface, and it's, it's I don't know if I'll say it's easy, but it's feasible, especially if you've got two people, to go out, flip that cage over, and let the oysters in the cage sit in the sun. And just doing that for four hours once a week has made a huge difference in terms of the biofouling community. And at least so far, we haven't found that there's any growth penalty or additional mortality associated with that practice. Gotcha. There are a couple of questions, uh, Shannon, about uh, triploids. Can you speak more to the prevalence of triploid oysters in aquaculture versus diploid oysters? And then um, another related question, are GMO genetically engineered oysters being investigated? So triploids are gaining popularity. Um, in the US, it's, it's interesting. I saw a presentation maybe about a year ago and they looked at you know, what strains of oysters people are growing worldwide. And when you look at these, you know, big oyster farms in France and other places in Europe, they don't rely quite as heavily on the triploids as we do here. But in Maryland, I would say that at least for the water column oyster growers, most of them are predominantly growing triploids. And now what you could do would be to use your triploid crop as your summer crop because they still have a really nice consistent meat quality all summer. And then you could grow diploids that you would sell over the winter. But sometimes for farmers, you know, they have all of these strings of cages and lines. And sometimes it's just a little simpler to just grow one type and not have to worry about keeping track of them. So we're seeing more and more folks growing triploids such that I would say they are dominant in the water column industry, a little bit less so in the submerged land lease industry. And then as to the question on GMOs, uh, I am not aware of any research going on into genetically modified organisms with respect to oysters. Yeah, the, the research by Lewis Plow, and, and basically it's like the Mendel and the monks did with getting strains of peas and corn, you know, it just crossing hybrids and, and getting the ones that do best in, in the low salinity. So it's not, um, you know, doing GMOs. Um, you know, I want to be respectful of time. We have so many questions, but um, all of the, after the, uh, we end, you're going to get an email tomorrow from Karen um, with some questions how to improve this. And, and um, Shannon will get a chance to answer the rest of your questions. Or if you think of new questions, you know, please, please send it. There is one last one that I'm interested in to hear what uh, Shannon says. Does anyone with a lease plan to start growing pearls as they have in Japan for decades? Has this been discussed in Maryland to your knowledge? You know, I have, let's see, I started here in 2015. 
and I have yet to find a single pearl in any of these oysters. So, you know, most of the pearls that are grown around the world come from a different species of oyster or even a species of mussel uh, than what we grow here in the Chesapeake Bay. So we grow Chrysostria virginica. That is the only species of oyster that we grow here in the Bay. And while they can make something that sort of resembles a little bit of a pearl, it's not the illustrious quality, um, those really beautiful round pearls that you would that you would expect. I'm gonna keep my eye out. I'm gonna still keep my eye out every time I shuck one to see if I can find a nice pearl. Gotcha. Well, I'd, I'd just like to remind you, um, Kenny Rose, one of our faculty members, is, is gonna talk next week on how models will help us understand the future of Chesapeake Bay. Kenny is really a world leader in, in the use of these models, so I think that will be a, a very interesting uh, talk, but I'd like to thank you all for attending and uh, hope you're well and um, I hope to see you next week and uh, we can just give a round of applause for Shannon. Thank you very much, Shannon. Thanks all for tuning in and yeah, come back next week for Kenny. All right. Bye-bye.